Thank you, Mike. And so our last speaker in this part of the morning is um, Louise Neville, who is Sustainability Officer at Quorn Food. OK, thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Louise Neville, and I'm Sustainability Officer for Marlow Foods, trading as Quorn Foods. Um, I contributed to the stakeholder backcasting stage of this project, and I'm actually a fairly last-minute addition to today's list of speakers, um, offering an industry perspective of the report in place of Andrew from the Food and Drink Federation. So I hope this isn't a disappointment to anybody, but thank you to the SCI team for the opportunity. I'll try and fill Andrew's shoes as best I can. Um, I'd like to firstly introduce a little bit about Corn Foods. Uh, we are the world's leading meat-free or meat alternative food brand and manufacturer. Uh, with the term meat-free probably providing the most obvious answers to why we're an interested stakeholder in this research, but I'll come to that shortly. So similar to some of the issues we've been discussing today, really, corn actually comes from an innovation challenge. Uh, back in the 1960s, and with concern that back then as to food security, the Rank Hovis McDougall Group began to research a process that could efficiently convert their abundant starch byproduct to protein. Um, and once a suitable microorganism was found in Marlow, Buckinghamshire, ICI AstraZeneca helped in scaling up fermentation technology as well as the creation of meat-like textures. Um, so corn as a brand became established in the UK in 1985 and is now sold internationally in 11 countries worldwide, um, soon to include Germany, South Africa and parts of Southeast Asia. I'm actually based at the North Yorkshire head office, and we have two more sites, one in Billingham and one in Norfolk as well. How nice does that look? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Back to business. So our products are soy-free, and we're the only brand that uses microprotein as our key ingredient. Um, as mentioned, microprotein is produced from a naturally occurring fungi, which is close to morel or truffle, which is grown through fermentation to produce a kind of dough-like paste uh, which can then be formed with ingredients and value added as with any typical food product to create an extensive range of meat-free products from our popular kind of scratch, cook scratch cooking ingredients such as mints and chicken style pieces to pastry and crispy coated products, ready meals and snacks, etc. In terms of our most popular product, a common tale I'm told is how the chef of the house attempts to challenge another family member to a, a blind taste test, if you will, um, by replacing usual beef mints of their spaghetti bolognese with corn, uh, often as kind of a lower calorie, lighter option. Um, I imagine with varying degrees of success, but I often hear this goes down surprisingly well. Uh, the photo is really just to highlight, uh, reveal the similarity between the hyphae of different proteins. So we've got microprotein is on the bo bottom there. Um, so it's kind of similar to chicken as opposed to soya on the top which is altogether less fractured, so it can't quite offer the same meat-like texture that, that corn, that microprotein can. So hopefully that unveils any mystery around our products a little bit. So what's cooking? One of the key, re key research questions of the report was what changes may be needed for the food system under high and low mitigation futures. So in short, businesses such as ours will be part of those changes. You'll notice from the report, and as we've kind of discussed so far, uh, that many of, the, many of the scenarios highlight a realistic necessity to reduce meat consumption and increased emphasis on vegetarian foods due to the significance of meat emissions, specifically methane. So the report states that if we include meat as an ingredient of processed foods, um, emissions from meat are approximately 28% of overall food and drink emissions. Uh, protein is, of course, an essential part of our nutritional needs, but this fact has often led to diets becoming quite meat-heavy, um, or certainly heavy in animal source proteins. So we need to really bring back our meat consumption to a sustainable level, and that's sustainable in terms of health, resource availability, climate, and animal welfare. Um, indeed, the 2006 UN report, Livestock's Long Shadow, revealed that global livestock production is responsible for around one-fifth of all greenhouse gases. Uh, that's more than transportation. So I certainly wouldn't want to appear as if our business is anyway encouraging the scenario, so let's all head for Mash and Banger, which is here, <laughs> or Lab Chops. Uh, we're working on becoming more sustainable ourselves. We're a food manufacturer, of course, so we're, of course, part of the issue. Um, the report tells us that food and drink contributes 11% of total UK consumption-based greenhouse gases, 
Also, food processing is actually dominant when we specifically consider CO2 emissions within that category. Um, our three sites use a lot of energy, and we recognise that we, as any food business, need to become more efficient. We need to maximise production. We need to use less to produce more. Uh, waste less, extract value from waste wherever we can, consider alternative raw materials. So this isn't particularly new to the business, but my research is allowing us to see the impact that these kind of initiatives have on our overall footprint. Um, as such, a bit of background about me really, my main project with Quorn is actually to carry out a product carbon footprinting project using life cycle or cradle to grave analysis. That's in partnership with Sheffield Hallam University and working with the Carbon Trust. Uh, we're working to the British Standards, Standards Institute's past 2050 standard for life cycle analysis and investing in building really a robust evidence base with which we can talk with confidence about our own emissions as part of this debate. Um, of course, whilst committing to reduce those emissions as well. So in terms of the triad of challenges discussed in the report, we've got food security, which raises the issue of how to produce more in a sustainable way or sustainable intensification as it is often termed also how we might adapt and also reduce emissions kind of now. Um, so the key theme themes I drew out of these from our business per perspective are around obviously the need for meat reduction, but also that there has to be a place for technology such as ours. Um, I'm sure most of us find the scenarios, particularly the four degrees ones, quite uncomfortable to read in places. And whilst it is easy to make a link between the likes of corn and the lab chop scenario, uh, yes, of course, there's comparisons to be made there regarding technological advancements, allowing innovation within food manufacturing. Um, however, our emphasis is on corn as a nutritious, tasty alternative that is part of a well-balanced, well vegetable-reliant diet. So hopefully we're not quite as contentious anymore as lab-grown meat. Um, it's still very difficult to imagine consumers being happy to pop meal pills or drink food shakes, it's quite depressing. <laughs> so other reasons we're an interested stakeholder. Um, in line with the research objectives really, we want to know what difference the scenarios would make to our supply chain. Um, as any food business, we're already dealing with, for example, price fluctuations for raw materials. And this will become more common as farmers deal with even more challenges, for example, more extreme weather events. Um, we are as susceptible to these risks as anyone, so we're glad and, and grateful to research scenarios such as these, um, and they'll inform how we as manufacturers react. Also, in light of the LCA that I'm currently carrying out, we're more aware of our emission hotspots now. Um, typically, primary raw materials are one of those, and as such, it's helpful to business to learn from, for example, section 4.2 of the report, which is around insights for agriculture. Just move on to a a quote from the report by a focus group member. So, for a lot of people, meat is a big staple of their meal, especially for men. So I think if a campaign was like, don't eat meat twice a week, I think a lot of people would go, so I starve for two days a week. You have to give people an alternative. So of course you have to give them an alternative, but could that be corn? <laughs> <laughs> On mention of um, SCI's consumer research, we've been carrying out our own research into kind of consumer perceptions of these issues, but also, um, for example, on, of on-pack eco-labels, um, the results of which are similar to those of the report, really. In general, we're hearing that the term food security is largely still not understood very well, unless that's in terms of rising food costs. Um, also, sustainability is still not easy for most to relate to very easily. Um, key priorities for consumers remain price, nutrition, and quality, they also pick up on food miles and overpackaging as well. So, um, but as you may expect, surveys of our own consumers specifically show they're quite switched onto these issues, of course. And if less environmental impact isn't a key driver for their choice of diet, um, which obviously tends to be more animal welfare, ethical issues, then it's certainly considered to be a bonus of that dietary choice. All food businesses are used to adapting to changing cultural tastes and trends, but we know better than most how challenging it is to develop products that suit our key market, which is still vegetarians. Um, so chiefly that's tasty products with a decent protein content and a vast array of versatile products or meal options. Also our secondary market of meat reducers and weight managers as well. So we know that we need to seriously avoid the sacrifice of anything, be that obviously quality. Also taste and flavour, texture, eat an occasion, otherwise the products just won't sell. 
So as a business, we're very aware of what is mentioned in the report as food habits being a reflection of wider socio-cultural settings, um, kind of means of, expression, means of expression, means of enjoyment, etc. Simultaneously, we ensure that Quorn can talk about these kind of benefits. Also making mention here of health and nutrition within a context currently of serious obesity issues in the Western world. Um, the report mentions that our influence on climate change shouldn't always be seen as hopeless, more empowering. It's more that we have the capacity to influence the extent of future change. So the visions of a two or four degree world mention the possibility of diet restrictions due to influence on crops of the weather. Also the need for increased adaptive capacity. So perhaps the empowering message there is that we could all become better connected with our food, um, with the food system, rather than accessing our usual fruit and veg in a kind of robot robotic fashion. We would need to know, for example, what is in season in our region at any time. Um, as mentioned by Carly earlier, this was prominent in some of the focus groups. And this idea of restored food connections is a strong theme also as part of, for example, the WWF's Taste in the Future campaign and also the Live Well Diet recommendations, which I've also been involved in. Um, attempts really to really pin down what a sustainable diet might look like. So just as a brief summary then, I, I was intrigued by this research from the very start really. I uh, find it quite refreshing in its clarity and accessibility and think it's a fascinating glance at what we could be facing as consumers in the future, depending on our willingness to make, ch make changes now. Um, lecturing the consumer won't work. Um, but context and clear information very well might. Uh, we would never present our business as being the answer for any of these issues. Corn is simply one business that recognise they may have a role to play, actually, within scenarios that, however they emerge, are likely to require a less uh, meat-reliant diet. Um, also, we're a business that's very experienced in adapting to consumer demands, for example, by reducing the fat and calories in our products for weight managers, or more recently by locking onto the fact that frozen rather than chilled products are being favoured by today's consumers, um, basically so they can avoid any food wastage wherever possible, and also make less of the big weekly supermarket visits. The scenarios warn us that we, all, that we as all food manufacturers may soon have even more challenges to adapt to as well, this time coming from many more points in our supply chain, as well as the challenge we've set ourselves. Um, to measure in order to reduce our carbon footprint. So many thanks for the report and many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.